parts mutilated by the samurai were in fact all prosthetic. It isn't, it isn't genuine, but it looks bloody real. But the audiences loved it. At a time when Cannibal Holocaust was outselling E.T. in Japan, Flower of Flesh and Blood rocketed into the top ten video sales. But the effects of its success took a sinister turn when in 1988 it was once again at the centre of a police investigation, fueling the debate over the link between real life and screen violence. Anybody who might be aroused by someone dying could have those arousal patterns fueled and reinforced by looking at snuff, a simulated snuff type film. <laughs> Sutomo Miyazaki had abducted and killed four little girls aged four to seven to satisfy his strange desires. He was finally caught in July 1989, attempting to kidnap his fifth victim. Amongst the 27-year-old's extensive video library was a copy of Flower of Flesh and Blood. Inspired by his favorite scenes from the movie, Miyazaki reenacted them on his victims, filming their torture, dismemberment and murder. But despite being inspired by a fake snuff movie, Miyazaki's own recording is not considered to be an example of the real thing. Where this person was not killed for production value, this person was killed for the sexual gratification of this violent sex offender. And after the visual record is made, it's not for commercial distribution, but those are not snuff films. After seven long years, Miyazaki was deemed sane and was sentenced to death by hanging. After a decade of hype and hysteria, a genuine snuff film had yet to be found. But subsequent movies made it even harder for audiences and police to tell whether they were watching the real thing or not. The arrival of cheap home video cameras would mean snuff could finally become reality. Professional and amateur videos were reporting to show assaults and murders, including so-called snuff videos, that are different from the type of material which is readily available. In the 1980s, the availability of cheap home video cameras enabled the general public to capture life and death images as they happened, in a way that wasn't previously possible. It signalled a new direction in the story of snuff. For the first time in cinema history, the greatest fear... The birth of the 80s saw faces of death emerge from the underground. It claimed to be a compilation of the most graphic images ever recorded, including scenes from accidents, executions and mortuaries. This film came out at a time when nobody had done anything like this before. It came out at a time when this dark uh, journey into the unknown uh, had never really been explored on such an exploitive level. Faces of Death compiled the news clips deemed too extreme to show on TV or in cinemas, such as this police shootout where the hostage taker is brutally gunned down on camera. It broke new ground by showing actual clips of real-life tragedy caught on home video like this fatal parachute accident, which is all the more shocking for being real. Faces of Death was banned in 46 countries, including the UK. The more controversial something is, the more people are told they can't have it, the more they want it. And thus, you know, banning Faces of Death was probably the greatest press it could ever have. The reason audiences were so convinced by Faces of Death was its clever use of real and mocked up clips, all shot on the same cheap cameras available to any member of the public. I bought footage of a woman who was committing suicide jumping off a building. That footage was about 40 seconds, so what we did is we shot inserts, video inserts of firemen running up the stairs, and then cut to her out front, and then all of a sudden she jumps. 
And then we see her drop to the ground, and then we did an insert shot with another actress with brains on the sidewalk. Much of the footage is faked, um, although for the, the casual viewer, I think it's quite difficult to work out sometimes what's faked and what's not. Many people were duped by the electric chair scene, which isn't real either. It's time. We built an, an electric chair. We went up to Chino, we hired an actor to play this, this guy who's on death row. Good luck, Joe. And then we cut to, as he turns the corner, we cut to the, a cell which we had built in a friend's loft. The process is simple. The victim is placed in a chair where electrodes are attached to his leg and head. And they tape his eyes and, and they strap them into the chair. His eyes are taped to prevent them from popping out of their sockets. And then we line the guy's mouth with toothpaste. We had tubes going around the back of his head, hidden by the tape, so that when he actually got zapped... I was calling out, all right, here we go. He would just have these convulsions, and eventually we had makeup guys squeezing blood. We had toothpaste coming out of his mouth. And the guy gave a really, a, an Academy Award winning performance. And that's why to this day, people actually think we actually got footage of an electric chair execution. If you go out and you put your money down to get a film in which people are dying, there's a tendency for you to just kind of accept, hey, this is cool, people are dying in here. And are you really using your critical thinking skills to whatever extent you have them? A lot of times people are not prepared to do that. The final trickle of blood marked the conclusion to this grotesque execution. Because it contains some real and disturbing images of dying, Faces of Death was reported as a snuff movie. Faces of Death is not a snuff film. A snuff film is when somebody is, is murdered on camera and it's really just down, out, down and dirty murder and sex. Faces of Death is an exploration into death. And no one was murdered to, to expedite death in our film. More than 15 years after Snuff's release, and despite there being no documented case of a real Snuff movie, the belief that they were out there persisted, and the myth gained greater credibility by the actions of depraved individuals like Alec Doughty. In the porn industry, we had quite a few informants, and one of them got in touch with us to say that Doughty had been in touch with him saying that he wanted to murder, torture two prostitutes and record it on film. We had our undercover guy, who we'll call Todd, get in touch with him uh, and they arranged a meeting at a bar at Euston Station and this guy started to talk about, quite freely, what he wanted to do. They would snatch the girls off the street um, drug them with chloroform, take them to a location which they were discussing, and to torture them and kill them. All the time we were saying that, you know, this, this must just be pure fantasy, but, but it got to the stage where he actually, he started to draw the implements themselves, and then at one meeting he gave Todd some liquid. I mean, we had it tested, it was noxious substance. So he was getting towards the act. He then gave Todd a name and telephone number of a woman in South London. And we made inquiries and found out that she was, in fact, a prostitute and she existed. We thought, we can't let this go on anymore. We arrested him and he was dealt with under the Mental Health Act. He was a very dangerous man. If he'd succeeded and the police hadn't been involved, then clearly that would have been a snuff movie. Um, yeah, absolutely. Alec Doughty had the desire, but lacked the ability. But whereas in the past, movie production required expensive kit and highly trained crew, amateur filmmakers were now able to direct their own films with cheap home video cameras. Jeffrey Jones did just that in April 1986, when he recorded himself murdering a young girl. Jeffrey Jones was charged with murder. He had hanged his victim, and he had done so under the pretense uh, of making a serious film 
of a decent nature, whereas in fact he had set out to make what in modern parlance would be called a snuff movie. Jones used his own home as a filming location. He lived in a suburban house on the outskirts of Birmingham, and in some ways it's almost bizarre that the ordinariness and decency of the, of the whole neighbourhood, there should be a house in it where the attic had been set up for such bizarre behaviour. Jones attracted would-be actress Marion Terry to his home with an advertisement in his local newsagents to make a film called Enough Rope. He described making a film which was going to culminate with a fake scene of hanging. The rope was uh, over a beam and a hook in the attic of Jones's house. Whilst the camera was turning, she would be standing on the chair, the noose round her neck, and it was at this point that he must quite deliberately have kicked the chair away from under her. In court, Jones insisted Marion's death was an accident and he was merely filming a simulated hanging. I expect he would have uh, anticipated that she would have hung there alive, struggling for her life for, let us say, five or ten minutes. Uh, just the very stuff of the perverts of snuff movies. The film Jones was making has never been found. I have a theory of my own that because he was so deeply into all these versions, he may have been in contact, some sort of network, of people who were interested in snuff movies. Uh, so in other words, the film may have been made not merely for his own uh, bizarre gratification, but actually for the purpose of making money out of it. If somebody has made a snuff movie, then they're not really going to show it to the world at large. That's direct, first-hand evidence of the murder being committed. You would be more likely to just keep it hidden. Despite the lack of video evidence, the jury were quick to find Jones guilty of murder and he was sentenced to life in prison. To take the life of any other human being deliberately is an horrific act. But to do it in such a calculated, bizarre way and to want to make and create a record of your doing so, perhaps the word monster is not wholly out of place. Alec Doughty had the intention of producing a snuff film but was arrested before